Now it's time to get into um, mood disorders and their treatment a little bit, which is of course an important topic because mood disorders are extremely prevalent. So depression is the most common mood disorder and it's characterized you know, by unhappy mood, loss of interest, energy, appetite, uh, trouble concentrating, uh, people may feel restless. Uh, so also insomnia, all the typical things that you already know about depression, um, those are the typical symptoms. So unipolar depression is um, the most common mood disorder we see. It's um, depression that alternates from normal with emotional state. So you're either okay or you're depressed. And this differs from bipolar where you can um, also be um, manic or be in a mania state. So unipolar is the typical depression that you think of when, well, when you think of depression. So we do see some brain changes with depression that are notable. Uh, first, you see increased blood flow to the frontal cortex and also to the amygdala. Uh, keep in mind, amygdala is that area we talked about that's associated with fear. So that that made some sense, you know, that you may have some negative affect um, caused by increased um, activation of the amygdala. You also see decreased blood flow to areas involving attention and language, which could explain some of those concentration problems that we see. And lastly, um, the cortex of individuals who are depressed, um, the right hemisphere of the cortex is thinner than people who are not depressed. So again, these are all correlational, but some of them do make some sense given the symptom profile of depression. So here you just have a scan showing the increased activation with amygdala and um, the changes with prefrontal cortex and whatnot. So moving into treatments for depression, we're starting with some of the treatments that are um, more physiological and more second line treatments. So these aren't the things you're going to use um, as your first attempt at treating depression, but if you have treatment resistant depression, that's where you can see these used. So electroconvulsive shock therapy, ECT, causes a seizure by passing an electro electrical current through the brain. Uh, believe it or not, this is still used and it's actually very successfully used. It's a lot better than it used to be. Um, we've done much more humane ways of doing it. And again, we only use it when someone is treatment resistant to other forms of treatment, but it is very effective. And one of the benefits of ECT is you often see um, differences almost immediately. So whereas other treatments may take weeks or even months to actually show a clinically significant effect, ECT you're going to see a much faster effect. There's also transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS, which um, alters cortical electrical activity through using a large magnet. So this is something that is just recently FDA approved to treat depression and you're seeing it used um, kind of similar to the way that ECT is used where it's a second line treatment. So these are both um, treatments that are again more direct treatments, more physiological treatments where we're directly changing the physiology in order to try to treat depression. MAOIs, um, so monoamine oxidase, first of all, is the enzyme that normally inactivates the monoamines. So the monoamines, as you'll remember, are norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. So this is, again, the molecule that deactivates those. So if you have a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, that inhibits these monoamine oxidase molecules, it's going to increase your levels of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. So what we see um, are these monoamine oxidase inhibitors were actually the first antidepressants, and they led to the monoamine hypothesis, which was that depression um, may be caused by um, having inadequate levels of these monoamines. And again, this was a hypothesis that was purely correlational based upon the fact that monoamine oxidase inhibitors seem to help depression. Now, 
there's a pretty significant side effect with these, and people will argue how significant of a side effect it is, but there's something that we call informally the wine and cheese effect. Um, and it's because fermented foods have tyramine, uh, which is eliminated um, by monoamine oxidase, but it's not cleared out effectively when someone is on monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So because of this, you can't eat fermented foods, you can't eat cheese, you can't eat wines, a lot of things you can't eat with this. And if you do, it can lead to extreme high blood pressure and can cause heart attacks or strokes. So pretty significant dietary limitations with monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which is part of the reason why they're not used all that often. Uh, tricyclics work by blocking the reuptake of monoamine. So you'll remember on the um, presynaptic dendrite, one, one thing that the dendrite does is it sucks back up and recycles those um, neurotransmitters after they're used. So by blocking this, by blocking the reuptake, you can leave the neurotransmitters there longer and they can have more of an effect. So that's what tricyclids do is they block this reuptake, they block the recycling of these monoamines, and it actually treats depression wonderfully, but it causes some pretty significant side effects such as um, sedation. There are actually um, some tricyclids that are used primarily now as sleep medications because they're just so sedating. Now, uh, one thing I wanted to a couple things I wanted to correct in the book. Uh, one, and I'm happy to provide references for this, the book says that SSRIs are more effective than tricyclics. This is simply not true. Uh, tricyclics are considered the gold standard as far as efficacy. So as far as treating your depression, tricyclics are best. However, SSRIs have fewer side effects, and the difference usually isn't that significant between the two. So that's why SSRIs are used more often. However, from what, from my reading of the literature, it is not accurate to say that SSRIs are more effective. That's simply not the case. Also, the book mentions that suicides are usually not an impulsive, or it mentions that suicides are often an impulsive act. Um, this is also not true. Uh, the literature that we have shows that death by suicide while it can be impulsive, usually is not an impulsive act. So I wanted to also make you aware of that because it drives me nuts when these things are incorrect. So I wanted to make sure those were both on your radar. So this brings us to selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So these are the more modern day antidepressants that you know and love. So uh, things like Zoloft or um, Patzel um, are going to be your SSRIs, and they work a little differently. So they're called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors because while the tricyclids are, block are blocking the reuptake of all the monoamines, these, the SSRIs, are more selective. They're able to just block the serotonin reuptake. So with that, it leads to less um, side effects than what you see with the tricyclics because they're more selective. Whenever you're blocking more than you have to, it will lead to more side effects just because they're, you know, you're changing the ecosystem more than you have to. So those are SSRIs. Again, those are the um, antidepressants that we typically see. Now, if someone fails at numerous SSRIs, so maybe you um, you try you know, three or four SSRIs and they just don't work for you, you will see people put on tricyclics. And again, part of that is because tricyclics are still very effective, but they just have the side effects. So like we had with the dopamine hypothesis, there are problems with the um, serotonin hypothesis of depression as well. One is that there's a long lag in, lag in time between treatment and reduction of symptoms. So again, you start seeing changes with um, the um, reuptake to serotonin almost immediately with more serotonin being available. And yet you don't have clinically significant symptom reductions for several weeks thereafter. 
So it's not clear if serotonin is the cause of depression, why there would be this long lag. Also, not everyone has helped um, with SSRIs, and there is a large placebo effect. There's actually a well-known meta-analysis that um, makes the point that it's, except in the case of extremely severe depression, um, and SSRIs actually do not outperform sorry, placebo. So let me say that again. Except in severe depression, SSRI medications across many, many studies do not outperform placebos. So that is a significant limitation of the serotonin hypothesis and um, also one that makes you have to consider your treatment choices. Now with this I will say read the literature, you know, be informed on it, make your own decision, talk with your physician if you're on one of these medications, and don't get off of it cold turkey. Um, always consult a physician with getting on or off any medication. But I do think it's fair, you know, the literature is there to say that we don't really know that SSRIs are helping that much above the placebo effect. Uh, there's certainly a reason to think that they may not be. And lastly, SSRIs um, may potentially increase the risk of suicide in children and adolescents. Again, that's a pretty, um, there's not great literature supporting it, but the chance is there. So it's worth noting on them. So a couple other treatments. Uh, one is deep brain stimulation. So with deep brain stimulation, uh, you stimulate the cingulate cortex to reduce depression. However, it's hard to assess um, because we know that treating depression has a large placebo effect and we don't have controlled studies for obvious reasons. We're not going to, you know, open you up and put a placebo in your brain. So with this, it's hard to know whether or not the treatment effect is more than placebo or if it's just the placebo. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has also been shown to be an effective um, treatment. It's actually shown to be as effective as antidepressants and even better than antidepressants over the long term. Um, another thing that's kind of cool is with, a, uh, with um, CBT, you also see chemical changes in the brain that are similar to what you see with SSRIs. However, research has shown that the best treatment results for depression are combination therapy, so it's where you have both the SSRIs and um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is because they they really can work in tandem nicely. It gives uh, people who are depressed a boost before the CBT and really help the CBT take hold. I often think of it as, um, think of the medication as a crutch. It helps you, you know, walk when you wouldn't be able to otherwise, and then the cognitive behavioral therapy helps you learn how to walk again so you no longer have to use the crutch. So we also know that people with Cushing syndrome have higher levels of glucocorticoids and that they're prone to depression. So glucocorticoids include many stress hormones such as cortisol. So thus, since we have a correlation, um, people have, of course, theor uh, theorized that the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal or HPA axis may be involved in depression. One reason for this is that individuals who died by suicide show an increased level of cortisol. However, it's a chicken or egg argument. Are people, are depressed people stressed or does stress cause people to be depressed? Hard to say. Uh, so, related to this, the dexamethasone suppression test can show excess cortical, or cortisol release, uh, which is again seen in suicide victims and depressed patients. So, what dexamethasone attempts to do is it tries to trick the body into thinking that there are already high levels of stress hormone. And what's interesting is that we see that people who are depressed keep creating more whereas people who are not depressed do see a suppression of cortisol. 
So let me show you the graph so you can see this. So here we have um, normal controls compared with patients with depression. And you have in blue the pre-dexamethasone and in red the post-dexamethasone. And what you see is not a huge change in the patients with depression, maybe a little lower, but not, at least the authors argue, not as significant of a change as up here. Now it's really hard to tell because these axes are different, as you can see. So this is going to look like a bigger difference than up here because the axis is wider up here. But overall, you see a lot more overlap here than up here. So suggesting that um, individuals who are depressed may just not have that system that shuts off the um, cortisol, so they may be more stressed. They may feel more stressed, and that may contribute to the depression. Now, interestingly, as their depression gets better, this system actually goes back to normal. So that's the good news, is they're not like this forever. This is something that does get better as the depression remits. So a couple other things. Um, with depression, more women than men suffer from depression. So one thought is that this may reflect patterns of help seeking. Maybe women are more willing to ask for help than men. Go figure. Um, however, there's an argument against this. Door-to-door uh, -door surveys find the same sets difference. So maybe it's not that women are seeking help more. Maybe it is a genuine gender difference. Another thought is that uh, men could display depression differently. They may display a masculine depression uh, that potentially has more aggression, for instance, than uh, than the depression the women show. So that's something that is getting looked at more in research. The cause of postpartum depression is not especially well understood. Uh, what we do know is that we typically will use counseling to treat postpartum depression just because mothers are still breastfeeding and the medications may have side effects for the child. And then, of course, I can't get away without talking about sleep and depression a little bit. So, as you remember from the sleep chapter, uh, sleep and depression are quite strongly related. And in fact, insomnia precedes depression more often than depression precedes insomnia. So, there are, all, there are actual sleep changes that you see in uh, depression. First, you have stages uh, 3 slash 4, so again, that's slow wave sleep. It's all stage three now, but um, stage three and what used to be stage four slow wave sleep are reduced in people with depression. Also, people with depression seem to enter REM very quickly, and they have an increase of REM sleep during the first half of the night. And what we see is that the latency to enter REM is correlated with the severity of depression. Now, what's interesting with all this is many SSRI medications actually suppress REM sleep. So another theory, you heard it here first, is that um, REM suppression could be related to treating depression. And there's some, there's actually some evidence of that, but in all honesty, um, REM suppression isn't necessary, nor is it sufficient to explain the effect of antidepressants, but still something worth looking at, especially given that everything else is correlational as well.